Hey, welcome guys. I'm Pastor Rex, Senior Pastor at Pursuit Church. I want to thank you for joining us for this week's teachings from our Sunday worship service. If you would like more information, you can find us online at PursuitNazarene.org. My prayer is that God will grow your faith through the hearing of His Word. So let's listen in. Here we go. Well, hey, Pursuit Church. Uh, welcome. So excited to, to be here. It's my, it's, it really is my privilege to be here with you guys. Um, I've wanted to make my way out this way for a long time. i um, known Pastor Rex for, uh, man, almost probably a couple years now since, since he's been here. And so really excited at what uh, God's been doing in and through you and excited to, um, yeah, be here uh, and open up the Word, open up the Scriptures with you guys this weekend. Um, this is, uh, so a little bit about me. I am, I am the, well, formerly the high school pastor um, at New Life Church of the Nazarene. And like uh, Jeff said, uh, it was Medford First Church of the Nazarene last summer. We went through a name change because we are actually in preparation um, for launching another uh, campus of our church in the west side of Medford. And so um, I will actually be the lead campus pastor for that church. And so I actually just finished up my last week in high school ministry this last Wednesday. It was super emotional and uh, super awesome. My, uh, my students sent us out really well. Um, and so here's a picture of me and my family. A um, little bit about us. Uh, that's my wife, Brooke, and that's my daughter, Juniper. And uh, we are... Like I said, we're pastors in, in, in Medford, and we met through, um, through a Bible college down in Central California. I know Pastor Rex is from down there originally, kind of outside of Fresno area, and, and uh, we met that way, and we've been married for three years this June, and are excited at what God's uh, doing in us and in our ministry and in our family, and, and super excited to be here with you guys. Okay, so today I want to talk about the presence of God. And I want to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit with you guys. And sometimes it, it, it feels as if Jesus' presence is, is with us. Would you agree with that? Sometimes we can sense God in a real way, and we can sense that God's Spirit is among us and with us. But then there's other times in our lives where we feel distant from God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a, in a spot where you're feeling isolated and alone? Um, I love the song that we just sang that, that sometimes we go through deserts and we go through wilderness, right? And, and, but God's name is still there, but we still feel isolated and lonely. And we begin to doubt if God is real. Sometimes we doubt if God loves us. By the way, if you have doubts like that, can I tell you it's okay? God can handle our doubts. But we get into seasons where, where we start to doubt if God is actually who he says he is and if he's actually close to us and if he created us, does he actually love us? Today we're going to be talking about one of the most likely ways that God shows up to his people. So one of the primary ways that God shows up to people is actually through his people. It's actually through the people that we are around. That's why, that's why being a part of a church community is really important. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. So let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever wondered what it is that God wants you to do? Like, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me in this life? God, what are you calling me to? I think most of us can probably say that we've had times in our lives where we're wondering what it is that God is calling us to do. Whether you've asked the question of, who should I marry? Maybe you've asked the question, hey, like, I'm dating this person. We've, we've been kind of going steady, and I've, I've got to come to a time, of a decision. Am I going to pursue this relationship any longer? I, I, had to, I had to make that decision, right, with Brooke. There was a time in our relationship where I had to kind of say, hey, is this, is this the person I was going to marry? And vice versa. She had to say that about me. I am praising God that she said yes. Uh, but we both had to come to that decision mutually, right? Um, or maybe it's, it's what job that you should take. Or whether the career path that you're on is what God has actually called you to. Maybe you're sensing a call to full-time ministry, and you're, and you're asking, God, what it is, what is that? Like, what are, you, what are you calling me to here? I've been in this job for a long time, and I know that you're stirring something to me, but I don't know what it is. Maybe, maybe you've got high schoolers in your life. And, you're, and they're starting to look for a college, and, you're, and they're asking, what college should I go to? Should I go to a Christian university or a state university? Should I go to community college or a university? Should I go to a trade school or a gap year? What should I do? God, what are you calling me to do? Maybe you've been in a season of life where you're like, man, should, is now the time to buy a house? Or should we continue to rent? Maybe you're in a season of life where you've, you've kind of, your kids have kind of flown the nest. They're off living their lives, and you're, you're starting to ask, do we really need this big house? God, are you calling us to sell our property, our house, the, the, this house that we've lived in? And there's times in our lives where we're saying, God, what do you want us to do? What 
do you want? And we might ask the question um, throughout the year, and even I, I, was, I was reflecting back on, on sometimes how we make goals for the new year. And we start to ask the question, God, did, did I do what you want me to this year? Like we're, we're in June, we're kind of halfway through the year. God, am I doing what you want this year? And one of the great things about this question is there's actually an answer to it. Isn't, that, isn't there great hope in that? There is actually an answer to this question of, God, what do you want from me? From the very beginning, Jesus has told us to go and to do, all right? So we pick it up in Matthew uh, chapter 28. You might know, it might be familiar. It's called the Great Commission. It says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded of you. And surely I'll be with you to the very end of the age. So from the very beginning, from the roots of the mission of the early church, Jesus gives his apostles, his disciples, this commandment to go and make disciples of all nations. But here's the thing. We're going to look at a story today where they're having some trouble getting going. So Jesus has been really clear on what they're supposed to do. They're having a hard time doing it. Jesus wanted them to go out and do, but instead they went out and they didn't. You know what I mean? Parents, are you with me in the room? Come on. I know, like, raise your hand if you're a parent. I know you're so tired you can barely even raise your hand. That's how we, that's how we are, I know. Grandparents, older siblings, whatever, if you're a babysitter. Have you ever told a kid to go and do something and then they go and they don't? You know? And you're like, come on, kid, do what I tell you to do. I've only been a dad for two years. Juniper is going to be two um, this next week on the 13th. And uh, we're getting to the point in this last kind of few months where we can, we can start giving her some directions. It's pretty cool. And we can say, hey, Juniper, go get your sippy cup. And she can go grab her sippy cup. Or she's really into watermelon right now. And so she can, like, eat some watermelon and say, hey, go throw that, that watermelon in the trash. And she can go throw it in the trash. Pretty cool trick for a two-year-old. I'm pretty excited for her. But if it gets much more complicated than that... Juniper can't really follow those instructions, right? So if I say, hey, Juniper, I've got this um, box of Ikea furniture. Can you set this up for me? She can't do that because I can't even set up Ikea furniture. I can't even follow those instructions, right? And so it's really funny because we can kind of expect that, right? Um, but you, you know what I'm talking about. If I, if, I, if I go and tell Juniper to go get me my shoes, I asked her to do that the other day. I said, Juniper, can you get me my shoes? Instead, she went and she put on my shoes. And uh, I've got a picture of that, I think. Yeah. Oh, not that one. The next one. Yeah. She loves to do that. She wears our shoes all the time, right? <laughs> you know, the good thing is, though, at this age, I can kind of expect that from a two-year-old. But in the story we're going to look at with Jesus, he, he doesn't expect that from 42-year-olds, Right? You, you kind of expect that these 40, you know, these middle-aged men, they can actually follow directions because Jesus is being pretty clear about what he wants them to, to do. He wants them to go and make disciples. And in the passage we're going to look at, he gets even more clear than that. Oftentimes we think that Jesus' last conversation with the disciples is what we just read, the Great Commission. But it's actually not. It's a few days removed from that, a few days after. Um, and it's actually found in the book of Acts chapter 1. Jesus t told them to go out and do, and here's what happens. So here's what I want to do. I want to read this, this passage in its entirety, okay? And it's not going to be up on the screen yet because then we're going to dive into it kind of line by line and run the text, okay? And so I want to read it, and then I want to pray, and then we're going to get into the text. So here it is. Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 6. It says this. Then they gathered around him, Jesus, and they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking intently into the sky? And so I, I'd like to pray together. Um, as, as we start to kind of get in line by line and start to kind of dissect the text a little bit, I, I want to pray that God would open our hearts. 
that God would remove any distractions, even if that distraction's me, right? And that, that we can be fully focused and open to what God has for us as an individual. None of, oh man, I wish so-and-so was here today because they need to hear this, right? This is, I think this is something that we can apply to our own lives and to us as a church body as well. So can we pray together? God, we, uh, we open our hands. God, we pray that right now we invite your spirit into this place. God, we invite you to do a work in us, a new work. God, we know that, that you will finish what you started as your scripture says in Philippians. God, that you've started good works in us and you will carry those out. God, it's not about us, it's about you. God, I pray that your name would be glorified in this place and God, that you would send us out on mission after we are done here today. So God, we give this to you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, so let's dive into to verse six here. Acts chapter one, verse six. Now it's gonna be up on the screen for you. It says, then they gathered around him and they asked him. So they're gathering around, right? So this kind of sets the scene for us. So we've got Jesus, we've got his apostles and disciples. It's probably more than just the 12, right? It's, we've got the church gathered around him and what will become the early church. And uh, this is sometime after Jesus already gave the disciples the Great Commission, right? So we're thinking maybe a few days removed from that conversation. And uh, right now is a super important and critical time because Jesus is preparing to ascend to the Father, meaning his time on earth is complete in human form. All right, And so this is a pretty uh, important time in Scripture. And uh, so they ask him a question. They say this, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And I love this question because if you just read the text, it's like, oh, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Like we were just wondering. No, I don't think it's like that. Because if we can really grab some context around this question, I think this question is asked with so much anticipation and so much excitement, what people my age call stoke. You know, we, we say, oh, I, I think they were stoked to ask this question, right? And uh, so they're asking this question, so it's more like, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Because we have to remember a few things. Just a month earlier, Jesus was murdered. He was crucified brutally on a cross. The disciples, they had faith in Jesus up until that point. And we gotta, we gotta really look at the scripture and say, when Jesus was crucified, their faith was lost. Because he died, for real. And he was buried, for real. And for three days, he was dead, finished, right? So much so where even Peter denies knowing Christ. And the disciples now, they were so sure. They had faith in Jesus. They were so sure about him. He dies. But now, the resurrected Jesus Christ is standing right in front of them, holes in his hands, and they're like, Jesus is the Messiah. We have the Messiah. They're living in a Roman-occupied culture, meaning there's, it's a pluralistic culture. They, they worship lots of gods in the, in the Roman culture. And they're like, we have the one true God standing right in front of us. Not to mention... And this is the context we need to understand, is that Israel has been ruled by foreign governments and kingdoms for over 600 years. 600 years through the Babylonians and the Assyrians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans. Different kingdom after different kingdom. Their culture oppressing them making them transform into whatever is going on in that culture, and they are tired of it. And the prophets in the Old Testament prophesy about a Messiah, a Savior, who will come and will overthrow these foreign rulers and these foreign governments. And they're like, this is the Messiah. The time of oppression is done. The time of being ruled by foreign governments is over. Jesus is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom back to Israel. That's where they're at. And if I was a disciple of Jesus right here, what he says next would absolutely take the wind out of me. He says this, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Oh, no. <laughs> right? Not in the way that you think is basically what he's saying. 
This is like when you want one thing and get something else, right? They wanted timing, details, a master plan of how Jesus is going to overtake the government. Is it going to involve war? I mean, they're ready to go to battle. They're excited, right? But Jesus has something else in mind. It's like when you're a kid and, uh, and you're, it's your birthday and you're like getting birthday cards and you're like collecting all the cash and you have your eyes set on a Lego set that you really, really want and you just need one more card and you got, you got this card in front of you like, oh, this is going to have the cash I need to buy my Lego set and then all of a sudden you open the card and it's just a card. No money, right? I know that's kind of a childish example, but I mean, I'm trying to think of what would absolutely just take the wind out of you. It was not what they were expecting. They're like, this is the guy. He's going to do what we want him to do. You see, the disciples, they were probably disheartened. They were discouraged. They were probably really confused by this statement. But here's the thing. Jesus, he was about to give the disciples what they needed, not what the disciples wanted. What the disciples wanted was to go to war, overthrow the Roman government, and have Israel be back at the top. But Jesus was never in the business of giving the disciples what they wanted. Jesus is always in the business of giving us, his disciples, what we need. And that's what he's going to do here. He said, you're not going to receive, you know, it's not for you to know the the times or days that, that are set by the Father's authority, but in verse 8, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on to you. And you, know, you see the disciples, they didn't need to know the master plan. They didn't need to know the details. They didn't need to know the timing. The disciples needed to know one thing, that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And church, can I tell you, this has changed humanity forever. The power of the Holy Spirit that, as Christ followers, you and I have within us, changed the game forever. So what Jesus is talking about here has literally changed humanity forever. This is the bridge that Jesus built between sin and between God. He said, through me and through, my spirit, and through my spirit, you can have right relationship with God the Father. And that's the world we live in now. He said, you're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit to do what Jesus had already told them to go and do. This is, this is why they needed it, to go and make disciples So then he continues and he restates what he had already told them a few days earlier. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The disciples wanted to know when Jesus was going to restore the kingdom. But here's the thing, church, and this is what gets me so excited about it. Jesus is telling them the kingdom is already here. Did you catch that? You are my witnesses to the kingdom. You have been next to me. You will bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. You will be my witnesses. You will go make disciples of all nations. You will teach them what I have taught you. Church, can I tell you that as Jesus followers, we are, we are uh, windows to the inbreaking kingdom of heaven here on earth. This is important stuff. As you were my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, the kingdom will be there. The kingdom is already here. You don't need me to restore a kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is here through my spirit, through the power of the Holy Spirit in you. After he said this in verse 9, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid them from their sight. So Jesus is gone. And I I don't know if this is just me, but I have kind of an overactive imagination when it comes to reading Scripture. It's probably because I've been a high school pastor in student ministry, but um, this 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 is it. They're like, Jesus, are you going to restore the kingdom? He's like, nope, not for you to know. You're going to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Peace out. And then he just goes, right? And he's just gone. Just up into heaven. And this that's the only way I can make sense of what happens next. Because then it says they were looking intently up in the sky as he was going. Just like jaw dropped, like, oh my goodness, Jesus just flew away. Like that's insane. And they're like, oh no, he's right there. You know? No, that was just a bird. That was not Jesus. And then clouds, just, and then like they're just, and they're just jaw dropped. Like, did that just happen? Right? He just, he just totally like took the wind out of us, told us this really cool thing. We don't really know what it means yet, and then just flew away into heaven. And I often wonder how long they must have been standing there. Right? Thirty minutes, an hour, a couple days. I have no idea. The text doesn't really give us any information there. 
However, we do know that it was long enough for God to send some angels to kind of kick their tails into high gear. You know what I mean? So then it says this, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing there looking into the sky? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a spot where you feel God's moving and you know God's calling you to something and you just can't quite get your feet off the ground to get moving? I think that's where the disciples were. I don't want to make fun of them too bad, right? Because I've been there. I know that that's a place we can find ourselves. So here's what's going to happen from here. They're going to leave the hill. They're going to go into Jerusalem and they're going to pray. And on the day of Pentecost, they're going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 people will come to know Jesus Christ that day. And then finally, here's what's going to happen. They go out and do, right? They go out and do what Jesus had commanded. They go out and do exactly what Jesus told them to do. They started in Jerusalem. They continued into Judea. Eventually, they ended up in Samaria. And we know the rest of the story because here we are in Grant's Pass, the ends of the earth, right? Jesus called them to go. And after a while, they got their feet moving and they went. They went to the ends of the earth. So what I want to do with the rest of our time is talk about kind of three principles that can help us get moving in the power of the Spirit, to help us bring the kingdom of God wherever we're at, to bring heaven to earth, to be God's witnesses, Jesus' witnesses to the kingdom here, right here on earth as it is in heaven. So how do we do this? I think that we can kind of look to back in the text for some of this direct instruction on how we are to be um, Jesus' witnesses and what he's kind of commanding us to do. I think we get this instruction. I think the first thing that Jesus says is, start where you are, right? I think that's, one of, that's, that's a principle that we can pull from this text. Jesus didn't say, go be my, my disciples to the ends of the earth, right? He said, go be my disciples, start in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is where they were, right? If, if he said just, hey, just go out to the ends of the earth, they're like, ah, oh, well, how, how do we do that? We don't know how to do that. He said, hey, start where you are. Start in Jerusalem. Move on into Ju- to Judea and then up into Samaria and then eventually to the ends of the earth. He tells them to start in Jerusalem. So I've got a little map here. Um, did, we, did we get that map? Oh, yeah, perfect. Oh, that was Galatia. We'll get that later. Uh, I think there's a, is there a different one? Maybe. That, that one. All right, so here they are. So Jerusalem. And they were just outside Jerusalem when this conversation was taking place. And then we can see that Judea is kind of the entire state. So he's starting the city of Jerusalem because there's people who need to come to know Christ there. And, and that happens. Jerusalem be, uh, ends up becoming the epicenter kind of for the Christian faith in the early church movement. All right? A lot of apostles are posted up there. And then they continue to spread out to Judea and then eventually up into Samaria and then eventually, we know the story, right? We, we, we know about the Apostle Paul and the missionary journeys that are taken to get the gospel eventually to where it is today because we know about it. We're Gentiles, right? We know about the gospel because of this instruction. He tells them to start where they are. And church, I think this is really, really important stuff for us. I think it's so important because sometimes we, we can get discouraged that we need to go out and and do big things before we start. There's a story in Acts chapter 3 um, where the disciples, they do exactly that. It's probably, you know, uh, sometime after the day of Pentecost where the disciples, they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, they're, they're doing what they, they always do. So there's a story of Peter and John walking to the temple. And uh, this, is, this is kind of like us going to church weekly, right? It's kind of our routine. It's kind of our ritual. We, we walk into church, Right? Um, but for them, it was temple. They go to prayer every day. And so they're walking up the, the steps to the gate, and uh, that's when they see a, a, a guy who can't walk who's begging for money. And this is, this is a pretty common scene, even just like it is for us today. We can, we can see people asking for money, right? And uh, he, he reaches out to Peter and John, and he says, hey, he asks them, he asks them for money. And uh, Peter and John, they look at him, Peter bends down, and he says, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have, I will freely give to you. So in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And that guy got up and walked. And I know that you're like, well, hey, that sounds like something really big. But here's the thing, it wasn't. 
I don't think Peter and John and the apostles that day sat in there like, hey, we're going to go heal a guy who can't walk today. That wasn't the plan. They were just going to prayer. They were just on their way to church. And they saw this guy, and because they were in tune with the power of the Holy Spirit within them, they saw the opportunity to heal this guy, to give him faith so that he could get up and walk, and they just did something. They didn't, they didn't have a master plan to go heal every guy who couldn't walk in the city. They just, they started right where they were. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I'll freely give to you. So many times we think that we have to do something big to join in on God's mission in the world, or we won't do it at all. But Jesus doesn't say do something big for the kingdom of God. He just says do something. Church, can I tell you, we don't have to have all the resources we don't have to have all the facilities. We don't have to have all the people to start where we are and move in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, do something. What is God calling you to do as an individual? What is God calling you to do as a church? Start where you are. They were just on their way to the temple, and they were attentive to the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the things I love about getting to hang out with Pastor Rex every once in a while, um, we've, we've got a cool relationship. I, I get to see him about once a month. Um, right now, I'm in the process of ordination within the Nazarene Church, and um, I'm in what we call the year of mentoring, so I'll get ordained next spring, and, and Pastor Rex is kind of my mentor for this year to kind of finish up this, this ordination track, and so we get together hopefully once a month. Sometimes it's not quite that because um, we're, both, we're both busy dudes, but one of the things I love about getting together is we kind of share celebrations with each other when we do. And uh, I get to hear about all the things that God is doing in and through you as a church. And I'm always so encouraged by what God is doing um, through your guys' ministry as a church here in Grants Pass. And, and I know from what Pastor Rex tells me that this is a church that knows how to start where they are. I know that you're a church that you know what God is calling you to do and that you can start where you are. I know that this is a church full of generous people who are moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. So what I'm talking about here, you guys already know, right? We just need to be reminded of what God is calling us to do. From what I can, from what I can tell, this is a church that already knows how to start where you are. And that's exactly what Jesus kind of has instructed his disciples to do. He says, start where you are. But then he didn't want them to stay where they were, right? Right? He says, don't stay where you are. So eventually, if we look further into the book of Acts, we can see that the disciples actually went, right? I already mentioned the Apostle Paul. Well, we know that he took, he took a few missionary journeys, right? And it was on one of these missionary journeys that, that Paul was in prayer. He desperately wanted to get, to get into kind of Asia Minor and go down into Troas. And uh, well, he was at Troas, and he, and he wanted to go one way. And then he's in prayer, he's seeking the Lord, he's being attentive to the power of the Spirit in his life. And he goes to sleep, he gets a, vid a vision of a man from Macedonia, the opposite direction. And uh, in that dream, he concludes that the Spirit was not allowing him to go that way anymore, and that he had to go to Macedonia. I think there's a map, we had that map up. Um, the Galatia map, yeah, perfect. Yeah, and I know it may be kind of hard to see, but this is, this is kind of a map of, of Paul's journeys. He's over in Troas, and uh, he wanted to kind of get back into Asia, um, but then God's calling him to go to Macedonia, the opposite direction. And I, we, I bring that up because I think that, it's, I think that it's so important to be in prayer. I think one of the things that, that is common between these two stories of Peter and John and, and Paul is that they were in prayer they were, it was involving prayer that they were be able to be attentive to the power of the Spirit. I think in, there's going to be times ahead of you in your life that God is going to call you to go. Maybe you're already feeling that stirring. You're already feeling that God has something a little more for you and you just don't know quite what it is. I've been in that spot before. I've been in a spot where... Um, I desperately, I, I felt a call to ministry. I had no idea what it looked like. I knew God wanted me to serve him with, with my whole life. I was really into um, camp ministry and outdoor ministry. Um, I, I served at a big camp in, in Fresno, outside of Fresno for, for a little while. And, and, I was, and I was into backpacking and guiding students down, you know, rivers on rafts and stuff. And I just, I didn't know what God wanted me to do. And I knew, I knew he was calling me to, to go. 
in the year ahead, I'm sure that if you seek God, if you will pray, there will be times when God's going to disrupt your spirit a little bit. And God's going to call you to go as individuals and as a church body. Now, it could be going two cubicles down at the office to make a friendship or a relationship with someone to share the gospel with them. Or just to be their friend, someone who, who's in need of, of some, um, some positivity in their life, and, and you're just being intentional about that. It could be you just uh, being intentional with your neighbors in your neighborhood and saying, hey, we're, you know what, you know, once, once a quarter, once a month, once a season, we're going to throw a barbecue, and we're just going to invite our neighbors over just to build relationships, just to, let, just, to, just to be a faithful witness in this world. Maybe God's calling you to, to, to some sort of ministry, whether that's part-time or full-time ministry. Maybe, maybe you're wrestling with the call to serve God um, full-time, and you don't know what it looks like. I'm positive if you, if you spend time in prayer, God will start to disrupt your life. God will start to disrupt the things, that, the path that you're going down, and I, I'm sure that God will guide your steps, Right? I know for us in, in our season, um, I've really been asking this question of, man, God, do you really want me to go plant a church right now? God, is this really what you're calling? You're, you're calling me to step out of high school ministry, which I love, which I feel like I'm doing pretty good at, and which I, I'm having a great time doing. And God, do you want me to go do this new work? And I had to feel that call. I remember in this last season of our, of our church's ministry, um, you know, we, we have been feeling called to plant this campus, um, to do some work in Serbia through missions. And, and, and I, I remember um, w- being with our congregation and saying, I think that there's going to be times where God's calling you to go short-term on mission trips or long-term on mission trips, and that freaks some people out, right? More than just a couple weeks Maybe he's calling you to plant a church, go start a new work somewhere else in town so that more people can come to know the gospel of Jesus Christ and the Lord as their personal Savior. I know this is scary stuff that we talk about, but I'm positive that this is what God's calling us to do. And you might be saying, hey, Ellis, that's great, but you know, there's great opportunities maybe, but, but when, right? Like when, when, when is all of this going to happen? Let me tell you. You won't, you won't always know God's power, or you won't always know God's timing, but you can always know God's power. You can always know the power that Christ has in your life through the Spirit of God in you. But the key to all of this, it's prayer. With, this, with the disciples, the key to them going and, and doing the work of bringing God's kingdom to the earth as it is in heaven, with, with Peter and John, they were at the temple, right? With Paul, he was in prayer, Church, we need to be in prayer about where God is calling us to go. So I challenge you, will you pray? Will you seek where God might have you go? I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand idle, looking intently up at an empty sky. You see, the truth is, church, that Jesus ascended into heaven. His spirit was given freely to us. That's his gift to us. We did nothing to deserve it, but it's a free gift to us. And God has called us to go. Jesus has commissioned his church to get up and go and move in the power of the Spirit. But we've got to start where we are. We have to not stay where we are. And we've got to seek God in prayer. Let's live into the truth that God is already on the move and let's join him in that work. I'm excited. I'm excited to uh, be with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ in Grants Pass. I, I, I just, I have so much um, joy and so much love um, for you guys, and I'm excited to see where God takes you in the next season. Um, so what I want to do, I want to close us out with, with some prayer. And, uh, and I want to pray for a few things. I want to pray that God would give you clarity as individuals, because I know there's people in here right now who are wrestling with what God is calling them to do in the future. Some of you are called to go on a short-term mission trip or maybe a long-term mission trip, right? Give several months, several years to this work. Some of you are wrestling with a call to full-time ministry or part-time ministry, giving more of your time to ministry. I think as a church, God's God's equipped you with gifts and resources to continue the work of the gospel in Grant's Pass. I don't know what that looks like for you, but 
I have a, I have a feeling, I have, I'm sensing a feeling that, that God is calling this church to go and to mobilize and to move on mission together in the season ahead. So I, I want to pray. I want to pray together for each of those things. I want to pray that, um, I want to pray for Pastor Rex and the, and the gentlemen who are on, on the men's retreat. And then I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this out and then we'll be dismissed, okay? So God, we just, uh, man, we praise you. We're so excited, God, that you have given us the gift of the power of your Holy Spirit that lives within us. God, if we have not sensed that power, God, I pray that in this room right now, God, that, that you would move in such a way that would be new, that would fall afresh on us. God, that we can come to know you in a mighty and powerful way. God, I pray for the people who are in here, God, that you are kind of disrupting their spirit in a really good way. God, that you're calling them to something new. God, there's, there's folks in here who you're calling to short-term missions to just simply say, uh, God, I want to I go see what you're up to in this world and other parts of this world. God, there's people who are here that are involved in the community, in the local community. God, I pray that um, they, would, they would be passionate, that you would renew a passion for them. God, that they could serve this community well. God, that they could be a presence in the community. That, God, if they were not here, that the community would notice and that they would grieve. God, would you make Pursuit Church a church of, um, of being on mission in Grants Pass? God, I pray that, uh, that as there's people here who are feeling a call to full-time ministry, God, that you would give them a clear pathway, that you would bring people alongside them who would help them to grow in the things of you, uh, to become disciples of you, Jesus. God, I pray for this entire church in the next season, God, that uh, you would move in among them in such a way that you would give them clarity about what you would have them do with the gifts that you've given them. God, would you empower them in your spirit, in your name, to proclaim the gospel wherever they're at. God, I pray for Pastor Rex and the gentlemen who are on men's retreat. God, would you move in their hearts, even right now, God? We pray for them as they are talking about you. They're in community together. God, would they come back changed? God, would they come back um, knowing you more fully? God, we're so grateful for the gifts that you've given us. We're grateful for your church. God, we're grateful for a denominational church. God, that has connections up and down uh, the Oregon Pacific coastline and beyond. God, that we can come together in unity, knowing that you're at work among us. So God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, church, it has been my privilege to be with you, and I'm so excited at what God has for you for this next season. Um, and I just want to pray that you will go in peace, and that you'll go and you'll discuss kind of what, uh, what God has for you, at least with one person. And uh, I know that uh, they're, they've got stuff for you. When, I'm so excited that you got baptism Sunday, next Sunday. Again, I encourage you. Man, if, the, if God's calling you to take, that's your next step to go public with your faith in baptism. That is awesome. And I know this church would love to celebrate with you. I'll be celebrating with you next week from Medford and I'm praying for you guys. Well, church, go in peace. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and challenged to pursue a deeper faith in God through what you've heard. If there's any way that we can help you in your new faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at PursuitNazarene.org and we would love to talk with you. May God bless you this week and hope to see you back again soon. Thanks.